an international project of which we were very happy to be part of for almost two years, it looks like. And today we're gonna try and present uh, what we've been working on. And uh, I think I'm gonna start with that. So the topic of our presentation is digital da data for urban peripheries, research and transformation experience. So how do, how do we land on this particular take on the housing estates? As I guess uh, all of the participants here know fully well, uh, well, they are omnipresent in our cities and this is one of the uh, perspective on Minsk city. So you, you see, well, a very clear example of housing estate and al already you see how how it looks, but also what you may not notice from the first glance is that actually you have uh, buildings of very different ages here. Some built in 80s, some in 90s, some in early odds, but more or less this is what you have in Minsk. And so it's everywhere. And although there is a lot of information and a lot of topics there, we were at first really, uh, it was not easy for us to understand how do we go about this topic. Because in the literature and in the urban planning science, in urban design, you have a very, a lot of very bad examples of how the fate of the housing estates turned in the West. And there are two very clear and very uh, scary examples. One of them you see in the picture, this is uh, Pruitt Igo estate in St. Louis. Yes. Many of you probably know it was demolished because it was so dysfunctional, or at least this is how the story goes. The other example is Bilnermeer in the Netherlands, in the south of Amsterdam, and you see it's been rebuilt very, very thoroughly and with little regard to the nature of what it used to be. So th these two examples are just one of actually very many. So we understood that there is a lot of things to be learned and that there is a lot of information about these uh, objects, this part of our city in general, but that we really, really would like to know more about housing states in our hometown and in cities and Belarus in general. And this is what you see when you start basically looking closer. So this is a map of Minsk with the colors of each building represent, representing the age of its construction. And you very clearly see that it's mainly, it was mainly built in uh, the period after the Second World War. So all the colors, except for the dark blue and light blue, represent the buildings that were built after Second World War. And actually light blue colors represent the Stalinist architecture. <laughs> so it is excluded from here. So for us, basically studying and trying to understand large housing estates is understanding the most of our cities. This is basically almost all the fabric of our city. And more than that, if you take a look at this particular map, you see buildings in red representing stuff that was built after 1990s. And when you compare it to what was built before, you see actually little difference. And this is very characteristic for Minsk. It's probably less characteristic for even other countries of the former USSR, but Minsk very much proceeded with this tradition of the Soviet Union, very much not just in the building form, but actually in the way it was subsidized, in the way it was financed. So for us, it's like a continuation of the Soviet tradition, which very much is the the building force behind the whole the whole city and not just that it's not just the urban fabric that is pretty much large housing estates it is also the fact that most people really live there if you compare the two maps like this one which represent the population density of Minsk and then I come back so this part of city that are built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early aughts, they are the same parts where most of the population lives. And so with this in mind, we understood that 
what we need is really to understand the nuance and the difference between the housing estates because they look so alike that it's really easy to be fooled. And we didn't want to be fooled, we really wanted to understand how really looks the life, how does the life of housing estates in Minsk really looks. And when we approached that, we understood that actually at our hands and in this really mo very moment, we really have the tools to do that. We cannot, of course, understand the study them exhaustively to the degree that we would like to. But now new tools arrived and new data sources arrived. And with this in mind, we decided we're going to use these tools and these data sources to try and understand how does this whole thing work. And the tools and sources, data sources I'm talking about is primarily GIS as a tool system and data. Uh, this is quite interesting because we, by this point, already have a number of data sources that can be used and they can be of different nature, be it public data or private data or even open source data. And we decided we're going to try and play with these types of data to try and understand how does the life of housing estate look and how can we use this new insight for urban planning practice. So we did a number of projects in this area, trying to approach the problem from different perspectives. But uh, in the end, we settled on a number of pretty key uh, issues that I'm going to deliver here. So one of them is the issue of trying to understand how exactly does the existing housing estate change and how much and which speed it matures. What I mean by that is that, as you know, in Soviet Union, there were these housing estates that were pretty pre-planned and there were areas that were precisely intended for the use as uh, activity centers, local activity centers. But what we know is that they were quite often not quite complete by the end of uh, the completion of the residential buildings. And over the 30 years of independence and of the market economy introduced to the Russian cities, these local centers diverge quite a lot. And what is more important is that not all of these activities was really seen by the urban planning agencies for the simple reason that there is a lot of information that is not yet readily available in the form of very formalized data that is mainly used in urban planning agency. So what we set out to do is basically to try and understand how do local centers of Minsk large housing estates look, which parts are better served and which are served worse, and how does this structure of local activity centers that we see with the data we have, how does it compare to the city the way it is seen by the urban planning agency? And that's what we decided to do. So what happens in the reality is that quite often these new emergent local centers they are not seen by the plan agency because uh, you have a very ex old existing building and then sometimes it's been subdivided. So you have one owner, but then instead of one activity there, you have three or five smaller activities and they change over time. And this may not be registered. Also, you will have the uh, first floor or the ground floor flats that can be converted for different things and you have can have semi-temporary buildings that exist that may not be registered. So what you have in the end is the fact that the real life of a housing estate is not fully uh, mirrored by the way it is seen by the public plan, public urban plan agency. And the result of that is quite problematic for the reason that if you don't see a place as important for inhabitants and local activity center is something that is important, if you don't see it, you may not try and make it better. You may not do paving. You may not use this information for the better of the people. And this is what you can basically observe in many cases. So this is the map of the one of the areas and the way it is seen by the urban plan agency. And we decided to try and take another look at it. And this is what we see. I'm going to delve into more details later. But this is one of the areas of Minsk. And you already see that the picture is quite different from what is painted if we use just official formal data. 
And what we try to do is to use quantifiable data from different sources to try and understand how does the life really look in this housing estate. And uh, so what we wanted to do first is to understand how in general is life in housing estates when compared to the whole city. And what you see here is a network of the uh, big centers of all the city of Minsk. Uh, the tool we used was set up in the way to catch only the most important, the most well-established and well-concentrated local centers, clusters of uh, points of interest, of functions, of some offering that economy does to the city. And already here you see that uh, despite the fact that Minsk is quite compact and is quite unified and everything is not that far from the city center, the concentrations of these centers are not very equally spread across the city. So you have the central city that is well served. And then you have one part of a city, which is its west, and it's generally more and better served than its southeast. And this is already the level at which you see that this most mature, most interesting part of a city, they are not equally spread, which means that access to these centers is not, is not equal and something is to be done about that. The other tool that we used gave us a very different picture, which is the vision of a city in a way that is served on a grand scale. And what you see here are basically three types of zones, which is the center city, looking very impressive here, and also two parts of the periphery that are reasonably well served here in the east, northeast, and here in the west. But then again, you see that southeast of city, which very much consists of housing estates, that not all of these housing estates are create are are, are living equally. So they were created equally, so to speak. All of this was built in nearly the same time, but they live a very different life. And here we try to make this picture a bit more nuanced using different tools. We try to understand and find, so to speak, winners among losers, Yeah, trying to see which areas are well performing among those that in general are not. And then vice versa, we try to see in the center city, if there are some places where you basically don't see this uh, nice saturation with uh, points of interest. So this is the general picture of a city. And now we can go into details and try and see how these housing estates look. So one of the first places that we went for is the Serbianka district. It is actually the one that I was uh, demonstrating to you at the very beginning of the presentation of this particular project. So there you see how it looks in detail when compared to the rest of the city. So the green color and the blue color means that the system of centers that we see here is quite poor, which means that this particular housing is large neighborhood, which consists of actually of a number of housing estates. It is divided into seven or eight subparts. It is not super well served. And actually you don't even have any centers of, of citywide importance in the direct vicinity. So not only is this the, this the area not super well served, but even neighboring areas are not well served. So this is quite problematic for us. And we decided that, okay, we see that there is a problem, but how does the whole neighborhood look when we see, and when we take a look at it as a single part. And there we see something interesting that actually lets us to make some conclusions for the urban planning practice. So as you see, red pixels mean that this is the place where the real center of the neighborhood is. And this is in the very north of it. So from the point of view of an urban planner, it is quite problematic. Not just that, the geographic geometrical center of the area is presented as underperforming, which means that the concentration of objects there is far from enough. And actually, because we know what region it is, we know the story behind this thing, and it's quite easy. So in the Soviet times, this area originally was left empty, and it was not built up until the early 2000s. 
And when they did that, they did it without any strategic consideration. And what you have here now is mainly housing, mainly residential buildings. And as a result of that, there was no real possibility to build a proper local center there. And with no buildings to go, you can see how all the functions that could serve the whole thing basically gravitated to the very north of the place, of the whole neighborhood where you could build something. And this is quite a problem. And this is how we see the urban planning system fail. And this is a lesson for the future. So there you have a number of different representations of different tools that we used for the area. We did not border ourselves by just one tool, trying to use different approaches, statistical and arithmetic, but nearly all of them demonstrate the same picture with the center of the area gravitating severely to the very north of the neighborhood, with center being not well defined. But we also see if we use more delicate tools that actually something is growing in the very center of the neighborhood. Unfortunately, we very much know that because of the character of the building typology there, that there is no real hope, at least for now, that a proper center would be able to sprout there. And there is another slide, basically in further detail, demonstrating the same thing. A primary center for the whole area is in the very north, and there is an emerging center. And we know as urban planners that this is a clear sign of the fact that maybe we need to pay some specific attention to this exact area and try and understand how do we make it grow better. So this is one of the areas. The other is Urucia. This is one of the areas that you could see in the citywide map, uh, and it looked quite good. Actually, its function offering is really nice, especially for a housing area. And so you see the red color, which means there is a lot of objects there, and that is very, very mature. And it is even comparable to the of function offering of the city center. But how does it look in details? And there are quite interesting things that we see here. So what we see here is the fact that what, where the concentration of the points of interest lies, where is the whole activity of this large neighborhood con consisting, I think, of six large housing estates. And the, the, everything here is going on around the underground station, which is situated here. But what we also see is the fact that the urban plan agency failed to see this going on. Yes, so in the map that you see here, you see that almost all the objects here are missing. Of course, you can say, yes, to a degree it is explained by the fact that what we see in the left picture is the master plan from five years ago. And yes, the data we used is a bit more recent. And so probably the diversity of the points of interest was not as big five years ago as it is now. But still, you see a consist consistent topic here, which is that quite a lot of objects are missed and primarily, these are the objects that are situated in the ground floors of the buildings. And you see that uh, what master plan quite easily catches are large, big stores, which have big areas. But what they fail to see are tiny little new additions. But in fact, the and functional offering of the place depends on the variety that you can reach. And the highest variety we can observe is in this among these little tiny objects. And they are situated in a place that is not seen by the formal data source that urban planning practice has. So there is another uh, uh, set of maps here, which basically in further detail demonstrates the same issue here. So if we go into further details, we see that there is a plant center here. And as well, what you see here is the fact that it is a pretty defined local center, but it's not nearly close to the centers that we see here. And in the planning, we see that uh, they are not seen as possible. So this signifies a clear uh, 
uh, differentiation in path that the real life takes and then the path that is seen by the urban plan agency and this is quite a problematic situation and uh, a nice uh, take on this whole thing uh, is the fact that we tried and use this whole tool set for a different city which is quite comparable to Minsk, but quite different from it in many ways, which is Warsaw, a city where I live mainly now. And so we decided to check out how does it look there and how it compares between two cities. And so here we see one of the uh, old and established areas of Warsaw called Mortini. It is its northern part. This is basically where the city ends. So this is very much comparable to Rucha case in Minsk. And what you see here is a very de developed, very pronounced, big urban center situated in the very north of the area at the underground station. Uh, it is actually a very big mall and it is very, very, very... The concentration there is way bigger than any other place there. But how does it compare to the plants? And here we see quite a bit problem because, yes, uh, this was planned as a center, but this center was meant to be local. Actually, there was planned a set of two more centers, one of which was meant as an even more important one. The one that in plans, at least in theory, had to accommodate even more points of interest and be even more important to inhabitants of Warsaw, but we see that it just didn't happen. And here you can see it in further detail. Yes, so this was meant to be the most important part of this area. And we see that it just didn't happen. Instead, we have a different center in the very north of city, of the of this city area, and another one in the middle. But this place where it ended up happening, it's not the place which was intended for that. And I think this is quite a reason to maybe uh, try and in further planning, try and use this tool. And I know that there is some interest in this technology, but I also know that in Warsaw, they are already using that. And in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say about this tool is that I fully understand why the uh, urban planning practice in Belarus and to the green Poland relies on this uh, data that is not always precise, but it is important to for the data to be uh, to be legal and uh, to be justified and maybe to stay stay against the challenge in court, because what is produced in urban planning is, of course, a legal document. So uh, in the end, what I would like to say about the tools that we need, this is not the attempt to paint the urban planners as stupid people, or maybe of people who don't want to get into details. And I want, don't want to say that the data sources that were used before are completely unreliable. They are important, and we cannot go about doing our urban plan without them. But what we saw for housing estates in Minsk and in Warsaw is the fact that the existing tools can be complemented by the new ones. And this actually gives us a more nuanced, more up-to-date picture of the development of the housing estates and of course of a city in general. And with better understanding of what is going on, we can better aim our urban planning policies at the places that are of real important importance for people. And this is the way we can make life in these places better. And this is where I'm gonna conclude this part of the presentation and give my word to Anton. Yes, who is gonna proceed. Uh, do you use the same presentation or do we switch? I think we need to switch. Yes, so I'm stopping my share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see it. Thank you. Okay. So, speaking of data, uh, 
as a data engineer, I need to say so much about this part of our research. Data is actually the most important thing for all of us, for all data scientists, for all urban planners. And the main point in my words will be that the previous research was the one uh, which was related to the data from the private companies. Uh, this research uh, on which I'm going to tell some words, it's related basically on the data uh, provided by the governmental organization uh, like data set on public utilities and those from the communal, from the Belarus communal system. So what is 11 and 5.bel? It is the largest platform on communal data on communal complaints in Belarus. So everyone uh, in Minsk, in Vitebsk, in other cities of Belarus uh, who has some problems related to their housing estate, to uh, their inner parts of their estate, to some communal infrastructure can just leave the complaint and uh, look at the results, uh, look at how public companies how these communal companies will uh, fix the problems, will help you with some of these issues. So, well, okay. So why this thing is important for every city? First of all, every citizen can directly communicate with service organization. It's a centralized system and everyone Basically, everyone can see this, uh, can see how the communal organization works, can see which types of complaints other people leave into that application. And so it gives us the efficiency and openness in the utility sector. Uh, the second point is that we can directly measure the life quality. We can directly evaluate it and understand uh, the main problems related to the microrayons, to different housing estates. And of course, we can track the parents of local activity and difference in perceptions of people, how they see their micro districts, how they see uh, their houses and how they percept them. So basically, oh, we wanted to analyze all the complaints, all the requests related to this web application and related to the phone calls for this, like for, uh, related to the aggregated phone calls. So we had a large data set which cons uh, consisted of, first of all, phone calls on the 11.5 number and like web complaints which were uh, left using the web application. And so, first of all, we needed to find like some parents based on the, like tr translate the raw data into the human language. And first of all, we needed to like develop the data set and separate it by thematic categories. First of all, thematic categories of the complaints then like uh, distribute this data set by buildings age and housing topology like every point of data has its own unique address and so by this address we can see which types of houses related to this address and uh, or w which was the year of building of this house and last we needed to find some parents related to the location of the house in the city and, and of course location of the complaint in the city. So first of all, uh, the thematic categorization. Actually, we made two thematic categorizations. Uh, urban data planner. What? No, там будет и с Киева, где рак работает, и с Белиси. Okay, uh, so we like divided the requests 
the communal complaints by thematic cat categories. Uh, the first set of categories was related to children, comfort and safety, parking, accessibility of the urban environment, landscaping and greenery, and like safety, which was uh, comprised of multi factors. Uh, the yeah. main thing is to like translate raw data into human language in to understand how the data looks for us as people. So basically, after dividing the request by thematic categorization, we needed to divide the request based on the building ages. So we divided this and basically union it the data set, union it the visualization of that to see how much uh, different parts of complaints are related to different types of houses. So how much percent, so for example, Mm, are related to the car mobility in the houses of uh, 1990s, how much percent take the sanitary condition in the houses of, built after the World War II, and so on and so on. And what we saw here, and what you see on this visualization, that generally, if we want to make some housing topology, we are seeing like Minsk actually is really homogeneous. So we have like almost the same number of uh, complaints in different categories and different types of houses. Of course, we don't have like some issues related to the lifts in houses after the World War II, but basically all of them looks like something more or less uniform. So we can see that separating by building's age gives us a like, more or less uniform picture. But for example, low rise buildings of the post-war era are of course worse in like house conditions and they of course require specific repairs. So the second part is like to see the locational parts. First of all, we map the requests uh, in Minsk. Like the main unit of special reference framework is the micro rayon uh, housing estate. And if we organize data in this level, it's like um, reflects the perception of the city in the minds of people and it helps really to visualize real differences in the situation in housing estates and this gives us a whole picture uh, which comprises the like the whole picture of Minsk urban estates. So the second part of thematic categorization was categorization by uh, like by two parts. First part, which is related to the infrastructure and the second part related to the activity of people living in this, those areas, in those neighborhoods. So speaking of the first thematic category, we can uh, depict, we can map uh, the cleanliness of common areas. And so what we're seeing here, the red color, uh, the areas labeled by the red color are so named clusters of uh, complaints on common areas cleanliness. So when there are more complaints uh, than in the other part of cities and those uh, areas which are depicted in light blue, in white, are those areas which are like anti-clusters, which has, have low lower level of complaints than in the other part of cities. And the other city is like, uh, that is like more uniform, well, there are more uniform picture. And so we can, we can say 
if there is a cluster or not a cluster, it's uniform, basically. So what we're seeing here, uh, the red areas are, of, of course, uh, worker housing uh, built immediately after World War II. And uh, the winners are those which are the new houses, uh, new housing estates of the Western city. So it's basically, we can expect to see this picture. Okay, we have new houses here. We have uh, relatively old, relatively deteriorated houses here. And of course, we have like dirty cabin areas. So speaking of heating, speaking of basic infrastructure, heating is a basic infrastructure in our country. So without heating, you can't live, you can't survive in the winter. It will be really hard. So uh, actually, um, the clusters here are the oldest, a relatively old housing estate, and there are negatives in this plan. They have some problems with infrastructure and, and with heating. And of course, we can see that the newer houses are lower in the level of heating complaints. What about lighting? Okay, do you remember this picture? Try to remember it and look at this. So the picture is really surprising. Uh, we have so much complaints related to lighting. So um, lighting in the common area, lighting in the streets, uh, in the western part of the city where uh, newer houses are situated and were built. And we have anti-clusters where uh, almost no complaints related to lighting in the old houses built immediately after World War II in a single family house. Uh, why they're losers? First of all, we didn't understand this, but look at this picture, look at this picture. The cleanliness of common areas and the heating are basically the most important part of housing needs actually the most important part of needs of people living in houses. And so if we don't have heating, if we're living uh, in winter without some, like without some heat, without warmth, we don't think about lighting actually. If you have like dirty common area, if you don't have heating, why you need to complain about lighting in your common area, really. So that helps us to track the perception of the housing estate in the eyes of people living inside, basically. So, okay, it needs some more proofs related to sociology, but I think the, basic, the basics are seen here on these pictures. And so here we can see the aggregated results, the negative outliers. Uh, those which are, have higher clusterization than others. So what we can see. Uh, this is a, basically a map of the earliest large housing estates which were built immediately after World War II. And so all those houses has higher amount of complaints among other houses in the city. So basically it's a map of houses after World War II. And so we can see the parents here, we can see how the, how the communal complaints are represented inside the city, inside the uh, micro rents and those housing, large housing entities. We can see, we can see that the most problematic areas related to the high quantity of complaints are here and here. And what about positive outliers where the amount of complaints are lower than in the other part of cities. So you can basically see your large housing estates which are coming out positively, but we can see both new housing estates and 
all housing states. Why? So the reason is like the citizen activity. So in the newer part of the city, there are more active citizens who leave more complaints in the service. And in the old part of the city, there are people who don't have like uh, mobile phones, don't have internet. And basically they don't think about how to complain using this service. And so we can see that actually it's like the side result of our research, but we can see really the citizen activity. And that's an important part related to sociology and related to, the, to how to track the people living inside our cities. Thanks for your attention. And I think Dmitry and I will want to add some details about our comments and uh, the situation in those. Yes, but well, the thing is that uh, uh, almost all of this work was done with a friend, Eugene Kalinowski, and unfortunately he is in jail since late July. Uh, I, I don't want to make this uh, uh, a sad presentation, but we felt that we have to make it a bit of a tribute to him. Uh, and uh, then again, not to uh, make this sad, but just to say that there is a great guy and we owe a lot of our work here and uh, he's a great friend of ours. So <laughs> uh, yes, uh, all, of, uh, all of this would not, would not be possible without him. Yes. So yes, uh, uh, this is that. Thank uh, yes, thank you for your attention. And then, so after this, we will a bit extended our stay here. Maybe uh, Vladimir Tainikov can, uh, give a short overview of this situation with the uh, data and the ways of evaluation of quality of life and in general situation of cities and in particular of housing estates in the urban planning practice. And then we will proceed. Vladimir, are you with us? Yes. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm Vladimir Tainikov from the Institute for Regional and Urban Planning. It's a leading enterprise in Belarus in, in urban planning. As Dmitry said, we make master plans and detailed plans uh, for the most of our cities except Minsk. And I'm working here for 13 years. And I would like to say that uh, to say a few words about about my vision of the perspectives of usage, usage of open data in our project. So first of all, I would like to thank Dmitry and his comment for the presentation of the results of the project in our company and for the fruitful discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, the project pushed me and my colleagues uh, to review uh, our attitudes to the open data to think more carefully about of hidden cap capabilities. So the main question is how can we use the open data in urban planning pro projects? Well, for us, it will be useful in four cases. First, lack of time. Second, lack of data. The third, out outdated data and extra data. What concern, concerns lack of time, time data, and uh, our data, data using the information from open source mapping services helps to planners save their time and start uh, quickly analyze current city, city situation and to make some working scenarios of the future city of development that later will be verified with official information. At present, Gathering public data is time consuming and inefficient uh, on my mind. Here's a step by step example. Our organization uh, asks for data from the city. Yes, so then uh, the request may be issued multiple times and may take many weeks to get a response. Sometimes 
the response from CT is negative, um, the, the data isn't available, or the point of con contact doesn't know who, who has it. Sometimes there is no response, and uh, then we need to check the information. Our planners also go into the city and check in the information about building owners, architecture, history, etc. by their own eyes. Uh, then we need to digitalize, uh, to digitalize, digitalize the information because not all information are in a digital view. Uh, by the time uh, processing is complete, the data may be out of date, yes? So at this step, we need to decide what to do with this, with this fact. This all consumes to available staff time and stretched the already our burden pool of technically skilled people. And uh, as a result, we spent a lot of time uh, on gathering the information instead on analyzing it and developing of good city scenarios. Sometimes gathering of the information is never ending process. And then we need to decide what information we will use as an accurate source. So for us as a planners, it is clear that uh, the data need to be transparent and easily access accessible. Extra open data in such cases help us um, to confirm or deny some scenarios and calculation of the city development and also simplified the routine of the process of the data gathering. 10 years earlier, the amount of such free information uh, at the online map and sources was very low. Now the situation is different and uh, with the planners uh, can use it more bravely. For example, um, Eight years ago, I participated in the research research work devoted to assessment of the quality of life and living environment, and I was needed to map manually all banks, pharmacies, and other social objects, object to fill all metadata and so on. Uh, it was a very time-consuming process, and but now, uh, thanks to open data, I can extract the existing information and uh, analyze it with modern methods such as outlier anal analysis, uh, clusterization analysis, and uh, can do um, this in a moment. It's really convenient and frees up um, valuable time, wide the horizons, and thanks to the projects, uh, to this project, I skilled myself I suppose that we'll use instrument, these instruments uh, in my work more actively in future, and I think our plan is true. So uh, it's short comments, and thank Dmitry and his comment once again for the opportunity to understand better how to use open data in open plan project. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, yes, it was really nice to have you here now and also to have this opportunity to present what we did. We had a bit more time so we could go further into details. And so thanks for this comment and I hope, yes, it, it, we have some possibilities to, for future collaboration. Uh, I think all, all the slides are interested in that. And now that we're done with this uh, section, I think we can move to the Lun Misto presenter, Anna Denisenko, if you're ready, we can start. Uh, hello, my name is Anna Denisenko. I'm project manager, social urban project Lun Misto. Uh, it's Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, sorry, but I will speak uh, Russian. Uh, and now I win which on my presentation. One moment. Uh, you see my screen, yes? Да, хотела бы сказать о том, чем, что мы делаем и зачем мы делаем, и кто вообще такие мы.
Да, мы — это проект городских исследований Лун Миста. Мы — проект IT-компании Лун. И Лун — это не общественная организация, не исследовательский институт, а бизнес. И как бы зачем бизнесу заниматься какими-то городскими исследованиями? Зачем ему это надо? Дело в том, что у нас есть мечта. Мечта наша, чтобы Киев выглядел вот примерно так, как на картинке, чтобы в нем было комфортно, в том числе нам, потому что мы тут планируем там, жить дальше и сейчас живем. Но если бы вы были, были в Киеве, то вы могли видеть, что выглядит Киев сейчас э, как бы немного иначе. Э, это вот фотография сделана в одном из спальных районов Киева. И такая ситуация есть не только там. Нам как бы не нравится такая расстановка дел. И у нас появилась очень амбициозная цель, мечта сделать, чтобы все было хорошо, сделать жизнь в городе лучше. Цель очень амбициозная и большая, и как бы, когда вот так ее заявляешь, что она может казаться абсолютно недостижимой, но если ее разбить на какие-то более мелкие этапы, то уже есть свет в конце тоннеля. тоннеля. Какой мы видим путь достижения этой большой цели? Первое – это измерить город, Второе, таким образом создать спрос на изменения. То есть, и третье, это способствовать таким образом изменениям. Зачем все это нужно? Затем, что нельзя улучшить что-то, пока ты как бы не измерил его, не изучил. Да? Потому что, допустим, вот в нашем городе, говорят, там, в Киеве мало зелени. Но э, насколько мало этой зелени, где ее мало, пока как бы, не получишь ответ на эти вопросы, то сложно сделать город зеленее. Или, к примеру, кроме того, нельзя улучшить то, что никому не нужно. Потому что если, к примеру, людям комфортно парковать свои машины на тротуарах, и они как бы, хотят это делать дальше, то будет очень сложно как бы, э, мотивировать их перейти к другому способу мышления и видению того, как надо поступать и как делать город лучше. И чем мы, собственно, занимаемся? Мы представляем город наш, Киев, да, как э, такого больного, который плохо себя чувствует, э, но не знает, что именно с ним. Э, к этому э, городу приходят горожане. И спрашиваю там, город, что с тобой случилось, что, что такое, почему ты себя плохо чувствуешь, но он как бы не знает. И тут появляемся мы, Лун Миста, как такой аппарат МРТ или там ПЦРТ, э, который берет анализы у города и таким образом помогает поставить диагноз. И после уже как бы передает эти данные врачу, врачом тут может быть там или городская власть, э, активисты, урбанисты, аналитики. В общем, много людей. Да, мы э, анализируем э, большое количество данных, связанных э, с э, качеством городской среды. Качество городской среды включает в себя много всего, например, в социальную инфраструктуру. Э, вот мы делали инфографику об очередях в детские сады. Она... Э, Почему это, как бы, допустим, актуально для Киева? Потому что э, в Киеве, особенно в спальных районах, в микрорайонах, сейчас такая существует проблема, э, и многие о ней говорят, э, что если, к примеру, ты э, как бы планируешь э, отдавать ребенка в детский сад, то из-за того, что детских садов очень мало и мест в них очень мало, то как бы, планирование... Э, Подавать заявку в детский сад надо еще до того, как ты, как бы, собственно, начал заводить ребенка. Вот. И э, как бы, наша вот карта показывает, где именно наиболее э, проблемные микрорайоны, э, где эти очереди, детские сады самые большие. Вот видите, э, на юго-востоке, там что такое бурое, это как бы очень большие очереди, там активно сейчас строится жилье новая, многоэтажная, но при этом как бы есть проблемы с э, развитием социальной инфраструктуры. Э, также 
подобным образом мы изучали наполненность школ. Киева тоже существует проблема в школах, в классах сейчас очень большое количество детей, это как бы создает дискомфорт, правда сейчас на карантине немножко как бы вопрос стал уже не так актуален, но все равно. И опять же, это, этот анализ дает представление о том, в каких микрорайонах существует наибольшая проблема. Вот тут мы видим на юго Западе тоже много такого темного цвета, на большое количество э, школ с большим количеством учеников. Это, опять же, новый район, который сейчас активно строится вдоль относительно новой линии метро. И тоже там много молодого населения, много молодых родителей, а как бы социальной инфраструктуры пока мало. Э, у нас в команде э, есть прекрасный транспортный аналитик Саша Рак, поэтому у нас много исследований по транспортной инфраструктуре. Ну и в целом мы считаем, что когда человек, ну как бы транспортная инфраструктура это супер важно для города, потому что когда человек стоит в пробке, то он как бы бесполезен, он не платит налоги государству, городу, не приносит никакой особой пользы себе, поэтому транспортная инфраструктура очень важна. К примеру, мы анализировали, как будет меняться нагрузка на станции метро наши. Тут тоже видим, что вот на, на, последний, на последних станциях метро в ближайшем будущем будет все как бы очень грустно, много людей будет ходить, зайти в вагон, и у них будет много конкурентов, то есть это сигнал о том, где надо в ближайшее время активно развивать наземный какой-то скоростной транспорт, искать альтернативы автомобилям. Также вот, этот, вот это, этот анализ, он интересен тем, что для его создания мы анализировали данные Uber, в какой-то, ну, у них давно есть сервис, который дает возможность анализировать их данные для других стран, но в прошлом году они открыли данные и для Украины, и вот мы сразу этим воспользовались, посмотрели, из каких пригородов Киева дольше всего ехать как бы, в город. Это, в принципе, пригородные районы Киева, можно сказать, это наши спальники, потому что многие люди говорят, что я живу в Киеве, но на самом деле они могут жить где-то э, рядышком с ним. Э, вот эта карта очень интересно показывает э, состояние э, развития спальных районов и наличие жизни в спальных районах наших. Это карта... Сейчас, сколько времени вам понадобится, чтобы добраться до бизнес-центра класса, класса А, то есть это как бы топ бизнес центр И здесь мы видим, что эти как бы кластеры работы есть только в центре в основном, а большинство более удаленных районов, спальных микрорайонов, они как бы там все очень плохо. И вот вы видите на северо в востоке район Троещина. Это очень большой спальный район, в котором живет огромное количество людей, и он просто как бы его просто нет на этой карте, потому что там нету никаких, ну, вот таких вот мест работы, нет бизнес-центров, то есть он выпадает полностью. Да, потом э, у нас много как бы за 12 лет работы компании у нас собралось много ну и мы продолжаем как бы собирать много данных о жилье, о качестве жилья. Эта карта показывает такую тенденцию. Сейчас в Киеве становится все более популярно делать огороженные территории жилых комплексов. Таким образом, люди надеются как бы жить в более спокойной какой-то атмосфере и не встречаться с с вот этими всеми людьми из внешнего мира. Но это такая как бы иллюзия защищенности. На самом деле э, город от этого становится только хуже, и агрессия только нарастает и тому подобное. И вот мы хотели как бы показать эту ситуацию, э, что огражденных от 
посторонних ЖК становится в городе все больше, и что-то надо, наверное, с этим делать. Да, еще у нас есть любимая тема экология. Она любимая, потому что вроде ты как бы этого не видишь, насколько хороша экология в городе, но очень чувствуешь по своему состоянию здоровья. Это карта озеленения города, то, о чем я говорила. Вот можно сказать, что там в Киеве мало парков или много парков. С помощью этой карты можно увидеть, где действительно их мало, а где они более-менее как бы в наличии. Вот на юго-западе есть такое относительно много сейчас строят нового жилья, такой развивающийся спальный район там в ДНХ ТМК. И этот микрорайон считается очень зеленым, но, как мы увидели на нашей карте, это не совсем так, потому что там есть большие зеленые зоны, но вот таких как бы придомовых их практически нет, это большая проблема, потому что летом там э, очень высокая температура поверхности. Да, и потом нам в какой-то момент стало очень интересно узнать, э, какая ситуация с воздухом в городе. Э, у нас исследованием э, качества воздуха в городе на официальном уровне занимается Центральная геофизическая обсерватория. Они каждый день публикуют у себя на сайте, сайте данные о качестве воздуха, но эти данные за вчера, и никакого архива на этом сайте нет. И это вот как бы такая смешная, смешная история по Open Data, потому что как бы Open Data иногда это надо пойти в архив, взять вот такие вот книжечки с данными по качеству воздуха фотографировать каждую страничку, потом э, позвать команду студентов, чтобы они эти фотографии перенесли в табличке Excel, э, и только после этого ты сможешь сделать вот такую инфографику. Э, на этой инфографике мы видим, э, как менялась э, концентрация формальдегида в Киеве за последние 20 лет. В общем, мы сделали эту инфографику, как бы она была популярна, 4 тысячи лайков и возмущенных реакций, но эта инфографика не ответила на наш вопрос, что же с качеством воздуха в Киеве сейчас, и мы перешли как бы на новый для нас уровень от анализа существующих данных к созданию данных. Мы решили сделать карту станции качества воздуха, и как бы так себе вначале планируем, что сейчас мы там за пару месяцев все это провернем. Но потом оказалось, что как бы те станции, которые были в наличии, они не подходили нам, потому что они либо были для индор, для внутреннего использования, либо они были слишком дорогими, либо они были неточными. И как бы нам пришлось самим вместе с командой из факультета радиофизики, электроники и компьютерных систем самим разрабатывать эти станции. Вот они у нас в руках. Результат нашей полутора лет нашей работы. Это такие, он выглядит как, как палочка. С одной на палочке там находится центр, центр который измеряет концентрацию мелкодисперсной пыли. К центру крепится коробочка микрокомпьютера, все это ставится на окна. То есть, ну, людей, которым, как бы, которые помогают нам измерять качество, жи... качество воздуха в городе. И в результате вот сейчас мы имеем такую же карту. Около 60, 60 станций, расставленных в разных частях Киева и в пригороде. Они в режиме реального времени поставляют и нам, и всем желающим данные о том, чем дышит Киев сейчас, сигнализирует о том, когда стоит закрыть окно, помогает нам посмотреть, где с воздухом лучше, где хуже, и предоставляет нам возможность проанализировать весь этот огромный массив данных. Я надеюсь, что это будет частью нашего плана на следующий год, пока мы как бы аккумулируем все эти данные. Да, еще мы выводим все эти данные в такой веселый бот, который предупреждает, когда воздух плохой и надо закрывать окно. 
Да, я вначале говорила о том, что как бы часть нашего плана – это не только измерить голод, но и создать спрос на эти изменения. В этом нам помогают, спасибо большое, медиа. Если там еще пару лет назад про качество воздуха в городе никто вообще особо не говорил, не заикался о том, что там что-то с ним не так и что-то надо менять, то сейчас каждый день сайты, телеканалы делают какие-то новости о том, что, боже, 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 воздух плохой, власть, давай, меняй, очищай. Вот о нашу карту тоже было много разных сюжетов. Интересный момент, то, что у нас недавно были местные выборы, и даже некоторые представители политических партий брали наши исследования себе как бы, в предвыборные кампании, ну, как бы это не, не уходило в наши планы, но окей, берите, как бы, если чем больше людей будет знать, чем больше внимания, тем больше шансов на то, что что-то изменится. Да, и нам приятно, что нам еще даже за эту карту дали, мы стали финалистами конкурса глобального договора ООН, получили свой первый поиз, очень радовались. Вот такая вот история, которая о том, как немножечко мы приблизились к нашей великой мечте здесь сделать жизнь в городе лучше. Это еще как бы далеко не хэппи-энд, еще работать и работать, но мы как бы настроены оптимистично. Здесь мои контакты, адрес сайта нашего. Добавляйте в друзья. Спасибо большое. Да, спасибо большое, Анна. Дальше уже продолжены на английском. So thanks a lot, Anna, for this presentation. Uh, I hope it was equally understandable to everyone. And I think it's very nice how we see this actor, which is primarily business that is really interested in turning the city towards uh, some better outcome, especially given the issues facing in our cities. And so if you're ready, I suggest that that access team uh, goes next so shall we yes yeah, sure you should give it to Georgi first yeah. uh, yes yes we can we can start now uh, yes uh, we share my screen now. so uh, uh, yes uh, Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for previous presenters for the uh, very interesting uh, presentations about the uh, about the cities in their uh, in their living spaces. Uh, I think that uh, we also have done some similar analysis already. That is, uh, for example, Dimitri uh, presented, and uh, yeah, we can uh, speak about this uh, briefly. So I will start. Uh, um, I mean, I'll present myself briefly. I'm I'm an urban geographer, and uh, uh, I and with my friend directly, I I also uh, I co-founded this uh, ZAxis and a small NGO about uh, focusing on uh, spatial uh, data analysis. And uh, I mean, besides spatial, we also focus on everything that's data related. So uh, um, yeah, we are we are working on that. Uh, so uh, I will speak about brief uh, about the uh, use of. Uh, Using the availability of spatial data in Georgian urban context, and uh, just uh, uh, walk you through some of the uh, some of the specifics of this. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, while uh, uh, while uh, data poverty is not an uh, is not a news uh, uh, is not news for for none of us. Uh, Georgian case is quite quite interesting in terms of uh, data management as well. Uh, in uh, in planning activities, uh, for instance, there are a few uh, a few municipal governance uh, agencies that uh, uh, municipal and gov uh, central government agencies that are uh, um, uh, that are tasked with uh, planning, uh, both on local and national level. But uh, there seems to be this uh, uh, lack of uh, communication between it, uh, between these actors on uh, how they exchange their data and uh, how they provide the data to uh, um, to private planning agencies which are in, uh, actually in charge of uh, spatial planning uh, uh, in Georgia at the moment. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is this ministries of economy and infrastructure uh, different, uh, which are uh, uh, focusing on uh, national level uh, 
uh, spatial planning projects. So basically, they're just financing them, uh, but uh, but the planning activities are outsourced uh, to private uh, companies. There is also National Statistics Office of Georgia that uh, uh, that holds quite a large amount of data on, on the country level, as well as uh, on some of the municipal levels as well, uh, including the national nationwide surveys of population, households. Uh, employment or other socioeconomic indicators. Uh, and then there are cities and municipalities uh, who are in charge of uh, um, uh, local spatial plans, uh, which are also out, uh, outsourced to private uh, companies. They're just monitoring the planning activities. Uh, and there is this national agency of public registry under the Ministry of Justice uh, of Georgia which is in charge of real estate registration and holds uh, quite a large amount of countrywide data on, uh, um, uh, on land parcels and uh, uh, on their ownership, uh, as well as uh, uh, on their ownership, both uh, formal and informal. Uh, they have quite a large amount of data on that. Uh, but one thing that's, uh, that's uh, um, quite challenging is that uh, even though these agencies themselves have quite a, quite a big amount of data, they they don't uh, uh, they uh, they have this uh, uh, lack of uh, communication between each other, and there is no uh, there's no quite uh, uh, I don't know how to put it quite nicely, but there is no uh, a proper uh, platform or legal framework for them to share this information with each other and with. Uh, uh, and with other actors involved in planning, so uh, this creates uh, uh, this creates a situation where these uh, uh, private companies who are uh, in charge of uh, spatial planning in Georgia are uh, are basically uh, uh, working to get their own uh, to get to get the spatial data themselves, uh, which they don't really uh, share with the public later because uh, that's their own. Uh, data set they, they have spent time on that they have uh, um, they have uh, uh, reworked the uh, data and uh, done their own analysis so they don't really they, they're not really interested in sharing this with the public and it's quite understandable because they they try to uh, build on that and uh, try to monetize that so um, that's also another issue with uh, uh, with the data sets accessibility in Georgia and uh, uh, also even though there are a uh, few uh, platforms of um, uh, municipal or nationwide, nationwide uh, data sets, which can be visualized, for instance, on uh, using web platforms or uh, uh, applications, uh, they're not quite uh, uh, quite flexible when it comes to data, um, data requests. Uh, it may take uh, from weeks to months to, for them to respond to you. To data requests and uh, it's it quite uh, it makes uh, things like very very complicated for uh, for the people who are uh, interested in analyzing their own data. So uh, when we started the ZXIS, we were uh, we were faced with this issue and we were kind of uh, thinking of how 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 should we go about it and how how should we address this uh, uh, huge void of uh, public data accessibility in, uh, uh, if, we, if we if we if we are to do this. Uh, special or uh, any other data analysis that we want to do. So uh, we we turned to this uh, uh, data scraping and uh, data scraping from other uh, uh, um, platforms, uh, for instance, using Python R or GIS to scrape data from Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or, um, or Open Street Network as well. Uh, uh, so. Uh, we, we kind of uh, based our analysis on um, uh, in some of our uh, uh, small projects that we're currently doing. So uh, this uh, this is one example of that uh, that we used. Uh, similar to Dimitri, we used this Google Places API, which uh, which is a nice tool to to get the information of uh, of local urban activities uh, at quite a detailed uh, level. So uh, we use this. Uh, um, uh, these points of interest of cafes, bars, and restaurants in Tbilisi, uh, it's not it's uh, it's not a surprise for us to to find out that uh, most of them are quite concentrated and maybe overrepresented in the uh, uh, in the densely uh, densely populated or densely built up areas of the city, which is 
which coincides with the historical center as well and uh, some of the business activities in, in the city. So uh, most of the areas that are uh, uh, that are shown here in the red circle are are these large uh, housing estate areas where the Mikorayan, Soviet Mikorayans have been built around uh, uh, 50s and uh, from 50s to, uh, uh, to late 80s. Uh, these are the Mikorayans that uh, do not really have uh, either diversity or, um, uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, or the uh, big numbers of uh, places that people could go and uh, Enjoy. So this uh, quite uh, quite well tells us uh, how the city looks like in terms of local life in the uh, in the city. Another one was to scrape the uh, to scrape the real estate advertising website, uh, one of the biggest in the in the country. So uh, that's where the uh, real estate developers or people who just want to rent their own house uh, put their advertisements, and um, uh, this also offers quite a nice. Uh, uh, nice overview of the uh, of the city uh, in terms of uh, housing accessibility and uh, housing uh, uh, affordability. Uh, uh, the number uh, well, the names of the districts uh, shown in uh, in red are the ones where the biggest uh, uh, microrayons are located in the city, and uh, and this ridge line shows that uh, most of them are most of these uh, um, uh, these places are. Uh, uh, quite uh, quite affordable uh, in terms of housing prices uh, for daily or monthly rent uh, uh, compared to other uh, um, uh, other central districts like uh, like this one here uh, or, uh, or this one here. So uh, there are also mixed uh, mixed type of districts. For instance, uh, this one Sabertalo, which is also densely densely built up, but also has some uh, also has. Uh, um, has uh, older types of uh, microrayons, uh, basically from uh, 19, uh, 1950s, uh, older ones, but these red ones are the ones that, uh, that were built later. So it also shows us uh, how the uh, price, pricing uh, in these areas are quite uh, affordable in terms of housing. This is also this uh, Airbnb information that we gathered. Uh, it also, it's not a surprise here as well. Uh, uh, that uh, most of them are located in the historic city center or the business district, but uh, shows quite well also how the uh, um, how these uh, areas of uh, microrayons, for instance, are, are here like quite quite empty of uh, of this type of advertisements, and uh, it's uh, it's also like lines up quite well with the uh, um, with the uh, notion of the uh, sleeping district. So. Uh, Another one was uh, that we did with the large supermarket chains in Tbilisi. And this also uh, quite well illustrates how, I mean, this can be used as a proxy for, uh, for looking at uh, how uh, uh, social uh, uh, or economic uh, um, income, uh, for instance, in the city can is spread out, for instance, the, uh, yellow colors and the ton and the and this orange colors uh, concentrated in the outskirts show that uh, the supermarkets, which are relatively affordable, are located in the outskirts, uh, and the ones that are quite uh, quite expensive and uh, um, uh, and uh, have have more diversity in terms of uh, their uh, uh, choice of products are located in the. Uh, in, um, in the central part of the city, so uh, it also tells uh, about uh, food security in the city and, uh, to, to to some extent, I guess. Uh, well, now Iraqli will follow uh, follow up on how some of the social media information can be visualized. Uh, uh, okay, you can you can leave it on uh, on gear again. I can, we can change slides from there, right? Yeah. Okay. So just very briefly, I just want to emphasize the fact that they are really good sources of data. Uh, but in case of Georgia, uh, those data are just on a level of cities and regions or municipalities at best. And most of the time we don't have uh, good data on uh, micro districts or micro rayons as, as we all call it, call them. So these um, big companies have, or in any data company uh, have this data for good policy, which means that sometimes they, uh, sometimes they give away the data to public or they might give this data to non-profit organizations or research organizations or governments, and they can use it for like public goods purposes. Um, 
And in this case, I would just emphasize two such companies, which is Google and Facebook. And we analyze the data regarding to, to, the, to the mobility in the city and in, in Georgia in general, and how they, so they put out this data, uh, like state puts in uh, mobility data uh, for the public um, in, case of in case of Facebook. And the next slide shows this, uh, shows this uh, mobility data for Tbilisi, for example. So this is really, really uh, detailed data when it comes to a time series analysis. We have like each day compared to the baseline of February um, and basically shows you that how much uh, movement have been reduced or increased during the lockdown or uh, how, how it changed after many reg uh, regulations that government imposed to the public. So we have this really good data uh, for Tbilisi, but which, this is on the city level. Also, Google has this uh, mobility data, which uh, this, in this case, it is uh, divided into categories of the different locations uh, in terms of its, uh, the functions. Like we have the trans transit stations, workplaces, residential areas, and so forth. And it, sh it shows you how, uh, how uh, people moved into those places, how their movement changed uh, during the lockdown or other periods uh, after the COVID-19 uh, spread. Uh, but the main problem here is um, that this, these all the data are really on the level of cities or the regions or municipalities. Um, while we have potentially we have this data, the, in, in ideal case we might have this data. We uh, should be able to analyze the data because, um, uh, in case of Twitter, for example, Twitter is really really easy to scrape the data from Twitter and it's a really rich source of data. And in case of Tbilisi, we have um, we have the location uh, precision on micro district level. So we can, this is really good to compare the micro district level uh, um, data to each other. So if you want to compare different, uh, different micro dist um, districts, we can do that potentially, but because people in Georgia do not, uh, do not use Twitter, uh, we basically do not have that kind of data. Uh, if you take London, for example, people in London, in London, you have different boroughs uh, that uh, comprise the city in large. Um, so then you can compare those different boroughs to each other if, if you analyze Twitter posts, for example, but you can't do that in case of Tbilisi or other, other cities in, in Georgia. The same is true of, uh, but it's a bit different for Instagram. Instagram also has this uh, uh, level of precision of micro districts and micro ions. Uh, but in case of Insta Instagram, um, it's really hard to scrape the data. Uh, when I was looking for browsing the, the web for to find a ways to scrape the data from Instagram, it's really difficult, I think. Uh, and also, they do not have a clear uh, guidelines how you can use the data for uh, for your own an analytical purposes. So that's all I want to say that we have like different uh, good sources of data that we can analyze to compare to see how people um, uh, people live in this uh, micro districts, but we we can't do that really because. It is restricted to the to the city level most of the time. Thank you. Yes, and actually, I was curious how people in other post-Soviet countries, people like you, the organizations, uh, gathered such kind of data, uh, especially related to human behavior and uh, psychology, uh, and how do you compare people in different micro districts uh, in that regard? Uh, okay, so uh, thanks everybody for the presentations uh, and uh, responding to the the question that that was put in the air. It's actually very interesting, and we we went around this topic a bit, uh, but we did not try and work with this mastodons of data sourcing like uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Uh, but we did some sort of search, uh, like uh, attempts at doing stuff with uh, private sources of information, like information about brand, and then like brand twenty four, and they do some like aggregated stuff with uh, Twitter, also like analyzing the general attitudes and. Directly, you can observe what people think, and you can plot this onto the map, of course, and then, then see what's going on. Uh, also, there was a project that indirectly, I think, touched on this issue. We, we don't have it there. But so basically what we did, we put out all the grocery stores on Minsk. And there you have the, the important information that we used was the ratings and then the uh, amount of people that visit this particular store. 
And what you get in the rating is basically the attitude of people uh, to this particular grocery and their satisfaction level. But also when you when you analyze this particular data, like you need to understand that maybe like the this single rating, like two stars or four stars may mean something very different, especially at the lower end of spectrum, which was the most important for us because we wanted to use this ratings as a proxy for housing estates that were like in trouble basically so we 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 ended up with saying like okay if we get get the lowest rating it would mean two things one is that this is a, a, an objectively bad store bad grocery store and the other thing which maybe is more important is that somebody who does the rating is unhappy with the service and that may be not just because the service is bad but maybe it can happen because somebody is under stress which in our reality very often comes from being in poverty yes yeah? so if if you're permanently unhappy with stuff then you would be unhappy with your grocery store too so we did that and so you know like the the basic thing that you're trying this guess against is the random randomness hypothesis and we plotted this stuff uh, and it was not random at all. In fact, we had very exact concentrations that overlap with the areas for which we had most complaints for this public utility company. So uh, you, we did try and make some inroads into this semi psychological area and actually the public utility requests, they, they very much deal with this issue and actually there is a lot of requests that are very much about people being unhappy in general and you can track there were a lot of outliers and maybe anton can talk about them because they were quite interesting and there was quite an anthropological dimension to this story because we found some pretty interesting stuff anton uh yep and about which outliers are you talking about? We have no, like I'm not, what? Uh, uh, 115 and the requests that we found there, yes, there were yes, some yes, people, uh, a lot of requests and then some very weird requests and some very upsetting requests. Uh, yeah, yes. but uh, we of course have uh, like a uh, high amount of requests so, which like psychologically uh, can be interpreted as those which are somewhat angry, somewhat sad about the situation in the in their utility in the ho housing entities, and those directly uh, correlated with the, how users rated their uh, grocery stores. And another hypothesis, I think uh, I need to tell about this, that uh, the lower the rate, uh, the more like poor people uh, go to that grocery. What that means is basically uh, there are not so much poor people who uh, tries to uh, leave uh, the review for some shops. There are not so much people who think about this. And uh, if we have like, if we have like poor people who are going to the shops, we have no rates at all. But if someone uh, who is not a poor, who is going to that shop from other districts who is living in the district, uh, maybe not so poor, is going to that shop, sees the situation with the service, and uh, basically he leaves the bad review like with the lowest rate, and he, only he can see this bad situation, this drastic situation. And sometimes poor people can see the bad service in their shops and can like objectively review this. So we have like uh, the um, more review from people who are not living uh, in that 
in actually living near this grocery store. Yeah. Uh, there is also one kind of psychological dimension of reading into the data that we already used, which is again the data from this public utility company. And so basically, we have this map of clusters of areas where you have more requests adjusted to population or less requests adjusted to population density. But what we saw quite soon on the map is that not the, the results not always very easily track to obvious stuff like accessibility or something. And so we saw that you, you, you at least in theory have two possible explanations for each uh, level of activity. So you can have a low level of requests, low amount of requests, if everything is okay. So people are satisfied. But then you can have low rates of request submission if people are just so desperate with their situation that they just no longer file requests or as Anton told maybe they are poor or they don't just have this access to technology or they just have too much on their hands and because they are preoccupied with basically survival they would not file complaints about the lighting or maybe don't don't expect to light the lighting to get better and you have the same situation for the uh, high rates of complaining. So you can have a lot of complaints if you have a bad situation, you know, like you have real problems with heating or something like that. But maybe you can have high rates of complaints if you have young population that have high access to technology, and then they maybe are used to good levels of service from the their general life, like they're well off. So they, when they go to the shop, they get good service. And then they have this context with municipal utility company, and it may be not so great. And so they would be complaining more than their, uh, the same people living in the same house for ages and not expecting anything else. So actually, th there is, I think, not just that the data draws and helps us understand how do people feel. In fact, you, you cannot go about using it without paying a lot of attention to the emotional process behind the people who submit this data. Otherwise, you, you really are may not be able to, to, to understand what is going on, especially if we're talking about stuff that is not about some recreation in the center city, but if it's something that deals with people's immediate surroundings with people with places where people live and it's very important to them and you can you can be fooled i think but what is your take on this uh, well i mean um, uh, uh, these kind of data sets i mean they're always uh, quite intriguing in terms of uh, what they can reveal uh, and uh, I mean, uh, with uh, with Ulysses, for instance, uh, what we did with the uh, Google Maps analysis was that uh, just basically uh, looking at uh, where these specific places were located, you could just get the idea of how the um, how the lives uh, are there, for instance, for for ordinary people. For instance, if uh, if we look at the map, for instance, then we see that. Uh, the bars, for instance, are located uh, like they're like overrepresented in the whole central area of the city, while there is no single single place that is like, categorized as bar outskirts in, in the outskirts, and uh, uh, that's uh, that somehow gives the idea of, for instance, if if, a, if a young people want to go, uh, if the young people want to go to hang out with their friends, they would, they would have to go to the city center to. To drink a beer in, in a proper proper space, uh, they would have to go to uh, uh, yeah, they would have to cross like uh, ten or twenty kilometers in, in order to do that. So it's also um, yeah, that shapes behavior as well. And uh, um, yeah, given the uh, given the restrictions, I mean, uh, none of this uh, is going. Uh, um, none of this. Uh, has like um, 
it's not uh yeah it's uh none of this is like quite quite uh important now but uh when the lockdown or uh, when the covid 19 goes uh goes away then uh it will all come down to that as well it's when people will need to uh hang out with their friends and they will have to go to the city center and uh also address these uh, issues of uh, accessibility uh, in, in in a way so yeah, yeah, it tells uh, tells quite a lot, but uh, sometimes I would say that uh, I wouldn't rely too much on it because uh, uh, it's also somehow biased. Uh, it's also, uh, I mean, as uh, as we see with the ratings, for instance, of grocery stores, um, it it would say it would say quite a lot about people who has access to smartphones or uh, uh, all the internet, but uh, it would not really reflect the ideas of what uh, other people think. Uh, the same place, so uh, we we should also consider that restriction. I think uh, when we uh, when we talk about big data and uh, who does it really represent? So I mean that's uh, that's one of the big issues I think with the big data. And additionally, I need to say that all of that data we talked about really helps us to build, you know, like the Muscles hierarchy of needs of all citizens of our city, and basically, uh, without knowing what citizen needs, we can build a city which helps people, which is accessible for all of us, and basically, all the data helps us like more gen with more genuine visibility of these needs of our people. So that's the point. Uh, yeah, also, I, I have a question to probably everybody and uh, interested in like uh, uh, building on a thing like that uh, you Gur Gur uh, noticed that uh, thing would maybe revert that now we live in this uh, COVID lockdown situation where everybody is in their like home places. And like as you noted in so in 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 Belize, it means that if you live in a house in a state or on the outskirts, you don't have access to a bar or maybe to your access to the cafe. And so basically any function of the higher order, yes, of this rarely rarely seen functions uh, that you have to go to the city center, yes. So for this rare rare birds, so to speak. So my guess is that maybe over this lockdown, which is actually very long, it, it is already almost a year and we're going to be there for quite some time, that maybe people would, on one hand, you would get tired of your place where you live. But, uh, and this is a very Belarusian experience, when people spend more time in their like immediate surroundings in Belarus, new connections between people are built. And my guess would be that after this lockdown and this period of like forced passivity, people would be also interested in maybe spending more time in their housing estates, but doing it differently. And so the, there is like a two part question to uh, everybody. Like, do you think if you think it's going to be like that, or maybe it's going to go the other way around and in any case, would we be able to notice that and how would we be able to help this trend, basically, to help it be more stable? Because in the end, in the urban planning interest, we would like to make these places where people live more, more varied in the amount of things that are accessible. So the question is, if you think that COVID lockdown is going to help it, and if it is, how can we help this maybe renewed interest in the places you live as the places of enjoyment of the places where you meet your friends and maybe spend your free time not just the time when you sleep and you're busy i'm not sure if anyone has a comment but i'll, I'll, I'll add that uh um, yeah, I mean, it has uh, uh, this COVID nineteen uh, lockdown situation has like really well shown how the uh, how uh, how the uh, interaction between people uh, uh, is built up. 
uh, I mean, uh, for instance, I mean, uh, now that uh, now that the public transport is restricted, for instance, in some of the um, uh, some of the cities, for in Tbilisi, it has been uh, uh, it has been uh, the public transport has been stopped since uh, since already a month, I guess. Uh, so people do not really have uh, so many options to move around, and they are kind of uh, forced to see, forced to kind of. Uh, um, uh, stay in their own uh, immediate surroundings and uh, having no places to go and uh, having no recreation areas or having no uh, uh, meeting places where people uh, can gather and uh, build a sense of communities uh, is, uh, is is one of the critical issues for people to 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 overcome this isolation co caused by the uh, caused by the uh, by the pandemic. So uh, micro rayons in Tbilisi are uh, 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 have this huge, uh, huge issue of uh, uh, lack of uh, spaces of interaction between people, and it also builds. Uh, where I mean, this also uh, creates some sort of alienation, I guess, between residents, because among residents, I mean, uh, since people do not have places of, of interaction, they don't really know each other, and they don't really have uh, have this uh, uh, personal communication with each other. So it's also. Uh, um, and that reflects on the uh, quality of life of people, I guess. But uh, I'm not really sure if uh, if anything is going to change in, uh, uh, for better again in in the future. But uh, at least that's a uh, that's a huge uh, a huge problem for uh, for people living uh, in such such areas. Because uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, if you have to go uh, like 10, 20 kilometers to meet people, then uh, you don't really have a sense of belonging to the place where you live. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, this place is also, uh, uh, this micro rayons have, uh, have played a huge role here because of their design and uh, because of their uh, monotonous uh, 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 physical shape uh, hasn't been so, uh, uh, so attractive for, for businesses, but uh, not, yeah, I, I don't really know uh, how, how how this can uh, change in the future. But uh, uh, yeah, it indeed is a quite quite a big challenge for now. Uh, I'll, I'll add the two words. Okay, sir. If you can. In terms of what what we can do uh, as data analysis and data visualization. Um, like for example, if we to, if we had the opportunity to analyze uh, to do the sentiment analysis of tweets, for example, from specific places, specific areas in the community, especially around these blocks where people live, and then we had the opportunity to to compare the the data to, uh, for example, this COVID COVID period data, the lockdown period data, to the baseline before the COVID nineteen data, and compare the specific places and whether they differ in terms of sentiments, it would be really good to show, for example, you can present the government, for example, or city planners that this is something when, when there was regulation uh, against uh, uh, vehicle mobility, for example, uh, then we see that in this place, in this kind of places, we get more uh, positive tweets, for example, from the people, rather than from, from pre-regulation periods. So maybe we could contribute from that standpoint, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the only big and like quite famous uh, use of this whole data thing from Twitter is like this general study of the emotion and opinion on English speaking Twitter mainly. So there is this group of people who basically contacted Twitter when it was like a year old or two years ago old. And they have this very exclusive, if you think about trick where they get, I think, 10% of all tweets, which is a huge amount. And uh, the information from this study is that basically, at least English speaking Twitter is going down over recent like 10 years. So people get sadder and sadder and sadder. And at least in the US, like uh, it's gotten way worse with COVID situation, of course, and protests like the George Floyd protests and like, all these like horrific situations they get things even bad but then again i think we are reaching the like time horizon of these tools when we're talking especially about this like low-key time spent especially on the when we're talking about time spent on quarantine which 
may not be time spent in a cafe, but maybe you, you're going to be just walking around your place when you when everything is locked up anyway, and maybe there is not enough places to go to. If this is like a neighborhood that's on outskirts of a city, then it, it's super difficult to catch what is going on. In fact, unless you have this access to people's texts or this super, super crazy tools of analyzing the pictures or the text information on Instagram. I mean, this is uh, very, very difficult, I, I think. And very difficult to see how it can, can be used. But I think the other issue there is how do you complement these tools? Yes, because I mean, then again, like people talk, of course, and I think the most interesting and promising situation is combining this digital digitally sourced information and digitally analyzed stuff with some snippets some analyzed analysis that you perform with people and i'm genuinely interested in your and everybody's opinion on that it's like how do we combine it especially now that everybody is so used to being online but then again you kind of hate it and maybe people would be way more into talking about their stuff Okay, I can. I can. Uh, I was. I was thinking about it lately. Uh, for example, I'm taking part in, in one research that that is uh, that's trying to explore how people react to to the COVID nineteen and regulations uh, psychologically, how they cope it. And uh, the problem is that when we take data from from the web, when it's scraped, or we, when we have big data, most of the time it is a time series data, so we have a change in time. But the uh, the real life data, when people uh, uh, feel the feel the question is, for example, and you get the data from that kind of uh, kind of sources. The problem is that you have like one data point in one time, and it's really difficult sometimes to compare those and combine those um, two types of data together. Maybe some maybe there is some like some way to aggregate the the time series data. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure though. That's I think that's the problem. That's in real in real life when we get the data from the real life, we have time series data. Um, and when you do other kind of research, we have just a single point in time, most of the time, I think. Well, it's, I think it's difficult, but, but, but still promising. And uh, uh, we, I think we're nearing the, the end of the whole thing, but I think maybe if we have some questions from the audience, it's good time to do that. Uh, I, I'm not sure how to do, do go about that. You can at least maybe write it in the uh, in the thread to the right, or maybe you can unmute yourself or let me know that you want to talk, and I, I will unmute you. Oh yes, so I saw that Gleb is. I don't know. So. Does anybody in the audience have any questions to the presenters or maybe just something they would like to uh, put to the table? Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to comment on a slightly separate topic. Um, so we keep using this uh, combination of words called big data. And obviously big data is huge, but it's also very limited. And uh, there were some limitations that were already mentioned. And just another, way to think about it is that we depend on the methodology of uh, those big services. It's like uh, whenever they change their algorithm and their methodology and they don't inform anyone about, for example, how they uh, cluster or display or even place those points of interest on the map, we are screwed basically. <laughs> like in two years, it will be a completely different Google Maps algorithm and uh, you'll, you'll be left with incomparable data sets. How do we keep continuity of analysis and archives if uh, uh, we cannot compare data from five years ago, for example? And I'm sure it's even more the case with Twitter and Instagram because like 15-year-olds uh, don't use Twitter, right? They use TikTok and stuff like that. And uh, the time span when those platforms are useful may be limited. Okay, just a thought, may not be useful. Thanks. 
Uh, uh, yeah, th thanks for this contribution. It's definitely, I think, very, very not easy because the emerging this data across time and maybe across different sources can be quite difficult. And the methodology is actually very, very important and very difficult to source. There is one example I can name. There is something on Google Maps called uh, areas of interest, and they are very important in the end because they, they their function is basically to draw to, to you to interest in places. And so like in, in the context of places where people live and especially large housing estates, it's very important because like you open the map and then you see these brownish blobs, yeah, these like areas, and these are the areas of interest. And Google wouldn't say, how do they define these places? And already for the United States cases, there were a number of situations where they were systemically uh, not put in some places as interesting because they have this uh, lens, the way of looking at the place. And so you have a place that is interesting to the people that live there, but just the way Google sees it doesn't work. And you can say, okay, yeah, Google doesn't have to be about everybody's interests, but then again, it's the thing that everybody uses. And it's very important because like in the city center, everybody knows that city center is important. And if you go there, you would definitely meet something interesting. But then for places that in general don't have too much interest in places, it's very important that this methodology is uh, good, it's high quality, it's understandable and it's inclusive. Because otherwise you basically open the map and you see the place where you live, it's of no interest and all the places where your friends live, they are of interest and you have to go to the city center. And it may be true in real life, but also it may be that basically the Google Maps doesn't understand your place as interesting, so. And uh, uh, just to finish this thought, maybe uh, people who use Yandex only, they have a completely different view of the world. So if you go to Mstislav in the east of Belarus, nobody uses Google and you don't know what the hell is going on there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, th there is that, I mean. <laughs> It's 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 quite pro problematic. So there is a lot of promise in all of this story of new data, new new means of its analysis, but also <laughs> definitely doesn't make your head hurt less. It may be <laughs> a source of problems and a lot of interesting questions. Still super good work. So thanks. Yes. So uh, I think there is a time for one last question or comment from somebody if such a question or a comment exists. I'm going to scroll through the line. Okay, it looks like there are no questions or comments. So uh, I'm going to say thank you to everybody who joined us this evening, especially to those who found time to uh, do some work and have some presentations done. This is very interesting. I'm uh, really thankful for all this work and I think that uh, the audience found that really interesting at least I found all the presentations really cool and also thanks to this huge group of people I would never expect like for so many people to join us so thank you all it was very nice to see all of you here and yeah maybe Tina is gonna wrap us up at the end um Yes, thank you so much to you, first of all, uh, Dima, for organizing this and to all the presenters. I also didn't expect so many people who would join us on Friday evening, but because of the lockdown, there is nothing else to do. Um, like, um, yeah, I was uh, so, um, nicely surprised with all uh, the people who joined and uh, it's also like very, very interesting for me. Um, yeah, I, like also for my work and for my research, all the this data that uh, you're working with and trying to gather. So I think I will be contacting some people privately to ask more questions. <laughs> the ones in uh, Georgia. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. Okay, yes. So I think that's it. Yes. Yeah, thanks for a nice evening and have a nice weekend. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye.